Hello everyone, welcome to the Town Manager Download, a podcast about local government in the town of Shrewsbury. Today's podcast episode is going to discuss the planning process in town, along with housing, 40B, and economic development. Later in the episode, we'll be joined by Kristen Lass, Assistant Town Manager for Community Development and Human Services to take a deeper look into this area of work. But first, we'll get started by catching everyone up on some local events and what's been going on. Uh, at the town hall and among the other departments uh, as we move into the middle of the month of November. Um, as always, I'm joined by Principal Department Assistant Taylor Galusha. Welcome, Taylor. Welcome. What's up in the shrew? So, um, as, <laughs> as always, there's a lot up in the shrew. Um, we are starting to see the reemergence of uh, one through seven Maple Avenue, which is the former Beale School. Um, it's coming back into the public limelight and uh, two events happened over the last week. Uh, on November 2nd, the Board of Selectmen heard a presentation from Civico Greenlee, the, the developer, um, about their plans and then kind of a similar meeting happened on the evening. Um, I think it was November 9th uh, at the Shrewsbury Public Library, which I attended, that was run by Civico Greenlee. Um, they had a, uh, a room full of uh, interested residents and um, you know other members of the community there. Uh, they took a lot of questions. They probably spent about two hours with folks explaining their project, hearing feedback, mm -hmm. and then that will translate into some changes uh, maybe uh, before they go to the planning board in early December, uh, but they're headed to the planning board on December 1, so it's really exciting to see that project formally get off the ground and um, become a part of the shrew. So so where can residents go to find more information right, so there's online? A, yeah, there's a dedicated project page on the website, so it can be found off the planning department page and off the select boards page. So. Um, and it's completely transparent. We try to be completely transparent um, all the time, but every file that we've received for that project has been uploaded to the website. So residents can really dive in uh, what the project's gonna look like and all the details that have been submitted to us is up there. And uh, we're gonna do that for each and every planning board project, not just this one. So with the revamped website that you led, uh, we have a lot of opportunities to provide a lot of detailed information to folks. And so. when will we will when will they be in front of the planning board? Yeah, so December first will be the first meeting, but I would envision they're probably going to be there at least three meetings. So it'll probably take them um, through the February meeting of the planning board. Uh, each meeting will focus on a different topic, whether that's traffic or architectural standards and and site layout. Uh, planning board will be really thorough in their process to make sure that. Um, they meet all the criteria that mm -hmm. you know they have proposed to meet. Uh, it'll take a special permit through the planning board, and um, they may be able to get underway construction um, early uh, next spring or or in the summer. So obviously, still have to close on the property, but they've got to get through the planning board first. And that's like a normal process for a project of this size. You yeah. take a few meetings in yeah. front of the planning board. Yeah, I mean, a project like Lakeway Commons even took longer than that, but uh, for a project like this size, we definitely tell the developer, uh, Chris can explain the ins and outs later, but um, we tell them three meetings to hit the core aspects that the planning board needs to understand to make their decision. So, Awesome. Yep. And fall foliage is falling. Oh, yeah, yep, <laughs> yep. It's the our favorite time of the year of what do we do with all the leaves that have been on the trees all summer. So... Um, yard waste program is in full swing. We've been operating a, a modified program this fall. Um, I've had plenty of mixed feedback from residents, mm -hmm. as one can imagine. Everyone's favorite topic of what do we do with waste, whether it's natural or household. Um, so we've had, um, I believe it's been the last five weeks at this point, collections at South Street mm -hmm. um, on Saturdays from 8 to 12. We stubbed our toe at the start on how we had the site laid out for the first weekend, but we quickly corrected that. Um, and residents have been dropping their yard waste off. Um, and But now we're doing curbside collections starting this week. 
uh, which would be uh, the week of uh, November 14th and continuing through next week, uh, November 21st, which is the week of Thanksgiving. Uh, because that's a holiday week, it will continue through um, Saturday of that week. And um, yeah, so we're looking for um, success in this revamp model. It's really due to driver shortages that's mm -hmm. uh, been happening across the trucking industry and solid waste in industry. And we've had our challenges uh, in household uh, trash collections uh, at points, but yard waste has been our biggest area of concern. A lot of other communities have a lot bigger challenges than us. Um, some companies have stopped collections and abandoned their contracts with municipalities. So we're fortunate not to be in that situation mm -hmm. that have built a partnership with waste management. We know there's still challenges at times, but um, we're doing the best that we can and you know, staying on the trashy topic you can't put your uh, mattress at the curb anymore yes. or your box spring. So that needs to be um, part of our bulky waste program has been modified and uh, costs $50 now um, per mattress and box spring. You can still contact DPW and then take it down to the highway garage and we'll get rid of, rid of it for you. So I'm sure trash is going to be an ongoing topic of what's up in the shrew. Yes. So. We'll just try not Stay to be tuned. too trashy. Yeah. <laughs> We're wrapping up the strategic plan, which has been yep. like half of our plates, I feel like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the last exactly. year. <laughs> yeah, it's probably been more than half of our plates for the last year. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a really long time coming and a really good initiative that, that we started. Um, I always tell the, the boring story of uh, talking to the uh, select board, then the board of selectmen, and my first offsite with them in October mm -hmm. of 2017 and saying, look, we need to take a more strategic approach, um, put a comprehensive plan in place of what we're going to do. We need to ask the residents what they want to do for us. And that's as simple as it is. It took a long time for us to get here. Um, but we've really focused on earnest on that, in earnest on that over the last um, 12 or 13 months and started with the National Community Survey, did a lot of engagement with civic groups and business groups throughout the town, um, ended the, with a twice mailed survey to every mm -hmm. household and we received, you know, over 3,000 different um, engagements with residents throughout the process, which is really significant. You know, that's what we wanted to do from the outset was have the residents tell us what they wanted us to do for them as their local government. Mm -hmm. That's what we're here to do. So um, we're finally about to produce that final product, which will be a really nice document, but the proof will be in the pudding on how we use it. So starting in the fiscal year 24 budget process, which I hope we get to talk about in an upcoming episode, we're gonna be tying that strategic plan to our budget and just really putting it in action uh, from day one or before day one, before we even have the book in, in hand, start aligning everything that we do mm -hmm. to the strategic plan and, and meeting those initiatives that residents ask us to do. So really excited about that. Yeah. I know yeah. I jumped on late in town with the strategic process, but I feel like you all kind of laid the groundwork for following a strategic plan through like the goals that the select board establishes every year, your own yep. goals that are part of your evaluation criteria, right. and started moving the town in that more focused direction, especially with employee goals. I know it's a little inward facing. But, yeah. yeah um, I think we did it the hard way. <laughs> yeah, did it backwards. <laughs> yeah, we really did it backwards. <laughs> we said, what is, you know, what are those subunit plans and individual goals? and didn't have one place for them all to mm -hmm. point towards, which is what a strategic plan does. Um, so I keep telling department heads, hopefully we did it the hard way and it's a lot easier now. Yeah. And you can find a way to point your department in the direction that the select board has asked us to and the town manager strategies lay out to be and the residents have said, this is where I wanna be in 2030. So um, hopefully it just gets easier from here. But yeah, we've moved to that performance um, performance-based environment since late, well, probably 2020. It got a little impacted by the pandemic, but we we're headed in that direction. And 
we've come a long way in that short time period. So um, this will be a great document. I'm actually just looking forward, Taylor, you know the document just as good or better than anyone else, um, for the residents to see the strategic yeah. plan itself. Because I think it's the hallmark of what a lot of local governments do and how they communicate with their residents, and this will just be top notch. So we're excited for them to see it. So. Um, That's a good segue into the planning process in yeah. general and kind of maybe the part of local government that residents don't think of as much yeah. uh, in the literal planning and the creation of plans like the strategic plan yeah. and how they all fit together because it's not they're not operating in vacuums. They, right. they link up eventually. Yeah. I mean... I think if you, if you had to create a new city or town today in the middle of an unincorporated area in this country, you would try to figure out why you want people to move there and how you're going to lay the spaces out physically and where people are going to live and where they're going to work. Um, in New England, <laughs> that's not really how it works, right? That's not where we started. Um, we didn't really have that benefit to sit down and plan before people started to settle. And um, and then local government evolved as people settled and, you know, really didn't start to become a profession until the latter half of the 20th century. So um, in some ways we're catching up. You have these a lot more younger, I don't know if more younger is the best way to put it. <laughs> you have a lot younger cities and towns across the country that weren't founded in 1727 like Shrewsbury that have more mature plans than we do because they thought about what they wanted to do before they started doing it. So we're in some ways playing catch up and it's a lot harder to do that because mm -hmm. you can't sacrifice the culture and the norms of the town and the organization to just do the planning work. But hopefully now that we have the strategic plan in place, that will be our broadest and most comprehensive plan that everything will refer to. Um, and then I think we saw during the redevelopment of 1 through 7 Maple Avenue, where you can take a single lot and uh, build it into a variety of other right. overlaying plans or, or just the opposite. So right, we started to build a vision for the town center uh, and then saw an opportunity to build a vision for a single lot and tie those two things together. Mm -hmm. Um, if the strategic plan was in place and now that it is, is in place, it does tie into the vision for the town center as well of, you know, both thriving and prosperous to those strategic outcome areas uh, within the strategic plan. But um, all of the plans really need to fit together and we never want to create a plan just to create a plan. It should be there for a purpose and they're all to be of a different purpose and of a different level to provide us with direction. And the reason that we really have to create the plans is because we're here to work for the residents, like I said right. at the beginning. So the residents really need to engage with us and, and provide us input in what they want us to do. There's a certain level where, you know, the hired professionals and experts need to refine those details and make things happen, and mm -hmm. we do that. But we shouldn't be doing things outside the vision of residents. And that's where the strategic plan comes. That's where the town center vision, you know, yeah. that's what it is. It's a vision. What, what, what should it look and feel like in the town center uh, in the future? I think it's important, like understanding the planning process, because sometimes these higher concept plans could be difficult for residents to provide feedback on, but mm -hmm. being able to provide like concrete examples and make it a little bit more tangible, or at least know how these abstract plans fit into the concrete right. plans is super helpful. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think it, that is a natural tendency for, you know, whenever we did a lot of those engagement sessions and sat and talked to residents, right? Mm -hmm. People are, can quickly dive into a project or program that they wanna see. We just need to make sure that we're serving all residents. Right. And that's why the plans are as broad and conceptual as they are whenever we start with the strategic plan and then get more and more and more refined. And I, I think the one through seven Maple Avenue is probably the best example that we have of a, of a, of a, of a comprehensive strategic plan, a, a master plan, mm -hmm. there's a land-based plan, a vision for the town center and a, and a project plan for a spe 
specific site. Like that's how it's really supposed to work. Um, and it's something that we want to do each and every time that we can. And yeah. it applies to everything, right? It's just not about development. It can be about recreation. Mm -hmm. It can be about public safety and mm -hmm. how we provide those services. It can be about library services. And especially in Massachusetts and Shrewsbury Public Library themselves, they've always been a leader in strategic planning and making sure that they have the content that their users want and the materials and the 3D printers and all those other the things services to, and to satisfy their customers. Right. So. so one of the things we heard a lot in like the strategic plan feedback is about growth of the town um, and that we used to be a small town and now we're, we're growing, mm -hmm. especially over the last 10, 10 or so years. What are your thoughts kind of on Shrewsbury's growth? The last several years and do you have any advice for other managers who are facing similar situations and changes in their own communities yeah i mean i, I really think the growth that we've seen and uh proposed in shrewsbury over the last six to eight months is unprecedented um it's probably unparalleled i mean there so there was a, a number of growth cycles within the community over time definitely the 90s was the single family housing boom mm -hmm. and and um, you know now we're we have less space and less opportunities for sprawl, and the market's showing its hand to be able to um, and, and focusing more on multifamily development and things that make sense. So um, I, I think that um, growth in general has um, benefits mm -hmm. and it has its challenges, right? So. Um, Local governments in Massachusetts always have to think about the impact that um, they'll be on the schools. Right. But schools are the reasons, one of the primary reasons, if not the primary reason, that people move to Shrewsbury. So um, we don't want to compromise our schools. We'll never compromise our schools. We'll always build our schools, and therefore people are going to want to come here, and that's going to mm -hmm. keep us vibrant. Um, I've worked in a number of different states and a number of different communities, and some of those communities have been lower no-growth communities, and there's no vibrancy in those communities. Uh, it's not fun to be there as a manager because there's no opportunities to do new things, um, and it's, it's just not a place that has that feeling and vibe and community uh, cohesiveness that I think that you feel and see here in Shrewsbury. So, you just have to approach, I've always approached growth as, you know, we're a local government, you know, um, maybe I'm a free market thinker, like I, I'm gonna react to the market, do mm -hmm. the best that I can to make sure the town's in the position to respond, um, but I, don't, I would never wanna prevent growth on an absolute basis in a community because I think it has too many negative impacts. Um, and I kind of also say, who are we to stop growth, right? Like, who, like, what if someone said in 1996, that's the last house to ever be built in Shrewsbury, or we mm -hmm. should prevent this, you know? Town meeting has that opportunity to influence it, but time and time again, we've seen town meeting say no to that. And when we've adjusted zoning and things like that, we've seen developers say, well, we're smarter than that, and we can still figure out a way to do what we want to do. That's just market demand, and mm -hmm. I think we should s celebrate that in Shrewsbury and plan for it and be ready for it, but not shy away from it. So the town owns like several properties throughout town, whether it's conservation lands, spaces that have sewer water pumps on them. Yep. Um, I know we're moving in the direction of starting to plan for or looking to try and start planning for um, what to do with these properties and mm -hmm. how we can best use them to the resident resident advantages. Right. Yeah, I mean, a lot of properties um, have just kind of sat there and, mm -hmm. and we've had no strategy. So I think we're moving into the era where we, we are committed to developing the strategies and putting all properties in the best and highest use that we can, whether they're owned by the town or owned by private uh, entities. So, um, we are looking at a lot of properties that were in tax title that we transferred a town meeting yep. to kind of say, you know, how can we 
preserve them or use them or both mm -hmm. uh, for the benefit of the community? How can we take them as a blank piece of land and turn them into an asset, whether it's part of a comprehensive trails project or something like that? But I think that's the main thing to do is not just let them sit fallow and, and be an afterthought. We, we mm -hmm. should really, um, as land becomes more and more scarce in the community, uh, we should be purposeful whatever that means, whatever the end result is with, with each and every parcel that we own. Maybe some of them should be, should be sold. And we, you know, we did, you know, we attempted to do that with four properties. Mm -hmm. uh, at this uh, point, the market only showed interest completely in one, uh, maybe two. Right. Um, but it's better to, I think, present that opportunity than just let it sit on the on the sideline. Yeah. And some of these part like some of those properties that were moved from tax title to general municipal purposes could be super tiny, oh, yeah. scattered and unaccessible. Yep. Some of them aren't aren't. Yep. But a lot of them are smaller because they're taken through Right. Yeah. I mean maybe it was it was pre zoning. You know, maybe it was the nineteen forties. Right. They're, Our they're, unplanned. Yeah, they're they're <laughs> taking all these tiny lots or they're you know buying an acre and saying they could fit 80 houses on it or mm -hmm. something like that so we got a couple of those lots but yeah i mean just being more purposeful in what we do with them i think is was our goal with that we've, we've got a lot of work to do on those 103 properties um, we committed to coming back to town meeting in the spring of 2023 and, and talking about them at least um we've got some work to do to <laughs> be able to get there but um we can we can we can certainly do that and just have a better plan in place. So nice. Let's see. So um, I think one of our favorite segments is are going to be going, going to be, to be favorite, favorite segment yep, is going to be resident questions and things in your neighborhood. All right. So. Taylor will start singing the Who Are Your Friends in, in Your Neighborhood song eventually. Do you know that song? Sesame Street, I think. <laughs> yeah. I was, that was going way over my head. All right. So um, <laughs> maybe we'll skip that. So at least resident questions will be a favorite segment of ours. Um, and there'll be an opportunity uh, that we'll provide to residents. Do we, have a, do we have an official way to do that yet? Uh, we have to get the email set up. Okay. But it'll be some sort of town manager download email address right just to make it as accessible as possible yeah sometimes google forms can be tough for right people and making sure that everyone can use it so email was the so in an upcoming episode there'll be uh an email that's provided and otherwise we'll mark it the way to submit your questions and as we talk about different things or have general questions that come in, mm -hmm. uh, we'll take the opportunity to answer those uh, in a timely manner. So um, any yeah. questions that we've received on this topic? In general, I guess, yeah. obviously. So I guess <laughs> the two big ones are, why do we keep um, building 40B slash apartment developments in town? Right. The top of mind question related yeah. to growth. I mean, I think the word that I key in the most, and, and we'll certainly uh, let Kristen talk a little bit about this, or hope ask Kristen to talk a little bit about this when she comes in, um, is the we part. Mm -hmm. Like there, there really is no we. So these are private developers who use Massachusetts general laws, chapter 40B, that's what 40B is, it's a chapter of the general laws that favors housing. Mm -hmm. And when you do certain things and build housing because of the critical need in Massachusetts, you can overcome local zoning and other local authority that we would otherwise have because you're building housing. So um, we as a town aren't doing anything to build 40B projects. We as a town, and the local government think it's wise to partner with these developers to not go through an unfriendly 40B process, go through mm -hmm. a, a more mutually agreeable process to try to get some things from these developers uh, where it's appropriate and lawful to do so. Um, but these are still private developments, you know, mm -hmm. they could come in and, you know, it's, it's you know, 
whether you're buying a single family lot or you're buying six acres and putting up an apartment, it's still the private company or private individual who's doing that. It's not the town that's doing that. So uh, I think 40B gets a little mixed up because there is a process that the select board goes through sometimes mm -hmm. and, and people, but it's not initiated by the board. The board's reacting and trying to do the, the best that they can um, in pretty underhanded circumstances. They don't have a lot of leverage at that time. So it's a private transaction yep. between the property seller and the buyer. Right, yeah, it's, yep, yep, absolutely. And in some ways, if those things weren't going on that people see at the select board meetings, um, it doesn't mean the projects wouldn't be going forward. They're probably just zero. Public facing. Yeah, public portions. facing interest and investments mm -hmm. that we're otherwise getting, whether it's in the sewer infrastructure, water infrastructure, roadway infrastructure, um, things like that. Um, another common question that these are two that came up just a lot in like the strategic yep. plan feedback. So like how does growth and development help tax, like our tax, their resident taxes yeah. and the tax base? Yep. Well, I mean, it's our primary tax source, right? Improvements upon land and the general value of land is um, in round numbers. If we spend $175 million a year, it's a hundred million of it. It's, it's, a, it's um, critical to, um, the future of the town. It doesn't rely on unabated, unending growth. Mm -hmm. um, but whenever we can leverage the right investment, whether it's on the residential side or commercial side, and there's often more benefits to commercial because there's the multiplier effect of not only are we getting new tax dollars, um, residents are getting jobs, Mm -hmm. often higher paying jobs, more opportunities for jobs. So there's a multiplier effect on the commercial side. Um, but um, it just, it being our primary revenue source, it really fuels our opportunity for enhancements and better services for residents. And, and if you take a single family home or you take a multifamily home, the incremental cost of providing services to the multifamily home clearly outweighs a single family home. So uh, if you took 250 apartments over nine buildings that you see at Edgemere versus 250 single family homes, mm -hmm. the cost to the town of those 250 apartments versus the tax income and the cost to the town versus the tax income of 200 single family homes is at least equal, but probably to the benefit of um, less cost for those 250 apartments. Um, Obviously, a lot more growth, a lot quicker right. in, in the apartments, and there's challenges associated with it. But from a tax standpoint, it's all important. Great. I think we can let Kristen in. All right. Thanks. So we, we can have... talk about the specifics, her realm, kind of, yeah. through local government was planning, I believe. So let's welcome our first guest to the Town Manager Download. <laughs> Assistant okay. Town Manager, Kristen Lass. So Kristen Lass, Assistant Town Manager for Community Development and, oh my God, I'm gonna mess your title up. Whenever Health you and Human Services. Health and Human Services, our favorite part of the organization, yes. has joined us. Uh, welcome, Kristen. Thank you. Um, so we always wanna start off with our guests of just getting to know them a little bit better. So before we start grilling you with really tough questions that you'll struggle to answer, we just wanted uh, you to tell us a little bit about your career path in the local government, how long you've been with the town, uh, all those good things. Um, sure. Great. Thank you so much for having me on. It's great to be a guest. I think I listen to a lot of podcasts, but this is the first podcast I've ever been on. So that's really that's exciting true. for me. <laughs> 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 exciting. Um, so I've been with the town of Shrewsbury for 12 years. I started as the town planner under the engineering department before there was even a planning department. And then uh, in 2013, uh, the town meeting authorized the creation of a planning department uh, what, once the select board had uh, recommended that and we began expanding the department from there. Um, before that, I uh, really think that I got a knack for local government um, 
from a few programs that I participated in high school, one of which uh, is called Girls State, which it was a Massachusetts mm -hmm. program where two young women from high schools throughout the state were actually able to go to Mount Holyoke College for a week and interact as if we were a town and a town hall. And I really actually only came to this realization a few years ago, thinking <laughs> back, so how did I end up in local government? Mm -hmm. um, and I think the other thing that stemmed to my work in, in public service here for the town is, um, my parents, grandparents, and aunts and uncles primarily either owned small businesses in which the towns that they lived in or were teachers. Mm -hmm. So I think reflecting back, uh, that also led to my uh, involvement in local government and, and path forward. Um, I went to school for geography and really didn't even know what a planner was or what a zoning bylaw was, which is kind of <laughs> embarrassing, uh, but got my start in, in um in planning and, and geography at a local uh, land planning and civil engineering firm in Southboro. Um, and, you know, really never thought I'd start into local government until I came across Shrewsbury and was doing some private projects in town and, and was just so um, enamored and satisfied by the quality of um, the business operations here and the, the town hall staff that were so helpful and so thoughtful. Um, and I just go back to, um, I'm always fascinated with how people interact with their environment and, and where they are. I'm one of those nerds who goes on vacation and looks at the architecture and the way people walk and drive and yell about strip malls and, and streetlights <laughs> being in the wrong places. Uh, but I really just wanna help others get the best out of their life in the municipality. And right now that's in Shrewsbury. Mm. So where did you go to school? I went to Penn State University uh, for undergraduate. Uh, I got my degree in geography, and then I went to Clark University several years later to get my master's in community development and planning. So how, how, did, how did you go from that planning firm to the town of Shrewsbury? Um, I was actually furloughed with the planning firm uh, in 2018, excuse me, 2008 uh, to 2010 and just started exploring municipal roles. It was a little mm. bit more steady with the economy at that point in time. Uh, and, and that's how I landed here in Shrewsbury. Interesting. You'd work with Shrewsbury in the planning firm? I did. We actually designed the subdivision off of Nelson Point. Um, that, that subdivision that's going off of Lake Street that's been built there. Uh, we looked at a few other um, commercial developments in Shrewsbury. Yes, so had done some land planning here in town before that point in time. Interesting. All right, so uh, anything else you wanna tell us before we get into the hard questions? No, I'm just uh, very excited, again, to be on the podcast. Looking forward to our residents and business owners getting to know a little bit more about municipal government and the town of Shrewsbury in general. So Great. let's get into it. Yeah, so we've talked a little bit about today about the big picture planning process. We talked strategic plan. We talked a little bit about how strategic plans, master plans, and 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 uh the plans for like one through seven Maple Avenue kind of all come together. Mm. Um, but we want to we want to talk a little bit more about the intricacies of of housing and affordable housing um, when it comes to Massachusetts um, and and what you know about those things maybe in other parts of the country and how they're different. So sure. there's this thing called 40B, right? That's all everyone hears. It's 40B. It's a 40B. It's a friendly 40B. It's an unfriendly 40B. But 40B. So What's 40B? Um, where does it come from? Um, is there a 40C? I don't <laughs> know. What can you tell us about 40B? Yeah, I don't know if there's a 40C. I don't think there is. So 40B is actually a Massachusetts general law. So um, it's referred very loosely under certain things, but 40B uh, was created by the state legislature in, I believe, the late 1970s to allow for or require towns to create affordable housing. Uh, there was these towns who were saying, no, we don't want affordable housing in our towns. Go build elsewhere and the state really put this law in place to require every municipality so city and town 351 to have at least 10 percent of their housing stock be classified as affordable um, and we can certainly go into what does affordable mean because mm -hmm. that has a lot of different definitions um, so now people are hearing they're putting a 40B there, they're putting a 40B here. Uh, that really just means that a developer is coming in using the law of Chapter 40B to cite a housing development, whether it's rental or ownership, on a certain piece of land in a town. Where it more than likely otherwise couldn't go. 
Right, right. right. So many municipalities uh, don't allow for large scale residential developments. Shrewsbury does. We allow, we have zoning districts that allow for multifamily residential where some towns actually don't. But here in Shrewsbury, we're seeing a lot of these developments being put on land that are zoned industrial or commercial or even single family residential that don't allow for these large scale. Mm -hmm residential projects. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the most, for me, that's the most challenging part about 40B. And we've dealt with some of these developers, as I've said over the last six to eight months with this unprecedented growth where we've, we, we seem to be tripping over 40Bs, even though we're not sure what they are, um, you know, is that they're coming in and saying, look, town of Shrewsbury, you have a housing production plan that says you want to build more housing. So I'm going to build housing for you. So you should thank me. And it's like, we don't want you to build affordable, uh, or we don't want you to build housing where we want, you know, a manufacturing facility to go. Sure. So that's what's always been the most frustrating for me, um, is that it it really supersedes anything that we've planned. Correct. Uh, to do for the community, and some logic that goes with it, right? Uh, I don't think there's very many many planners. If you go back to the you know, smokestack days of this country that would say you should build housing next to the smokestacks. Yep. So we've tried to evolve and what we do as a local government to protect residents, but 40B can throw all that out the door. That's right, yes, we could have a, a multifamily housing development next to the landfill or next to 290 without an off ramp there or other undesirable locations. Sure. Right, yeah. So you, threw out the question in, in your comments of uh, what does affordable mean? So, mm -hmm. so what does affordable mean? Sure, so in terms of the state law, affordable means that someone living in these housing units that are deemed affordable or deeded affordable are making 80% of the area median income. So area median income is the Worcester area, which includes Shrewsbury. And let's just say uh, $100,000 is the area median income. Mm -hmm. A person making 80% of that, so $80,000, would be qualified to be able to buy or rent an mm -hmm. affordable unit in town. Mm -hmm. It could not maximize other assets. So they have to be making at least 80% of the income. Right, right. To, to be there. Or they can't be making more than 80% of the Correct. income, excuse me. Correct. So, okay, so 80% um, is still pretty high. It is still high, yes. So right. uh, some towns are actually requiring that if an affordable housing project is coming to town, it's either 50 to 80% of area, area median income. Mm -hmm. um, Shrewsbury doesn't have that mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I think about those days that, you know, at the time, um, my then girlfriend slash soon to be fiance, now wife Erin, you know, we were, we were trying to find that first place to live outside of Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. very high cost area you know, rented apartment way too far away and spent most of my life in a car. Yep. Um, I think about Taylor, right? You know, <laughs> just graduated with her master's degree yes. a couple of years ago. Um, rent is not cheap. Rent is not cheap, No, it right? is not. So it like, not. so affordable housing has a lot of negative connotations to it. Um, you know, I think people immediately think about, you know, really, you know, isolated bad stories of places, you know, around major cities like New York City and things like that, of these massive high rises and things like that. But affordable housing and, and, and 40B and, and those initiatives in Massachusetts, to their credit, tried to make these housing um, opportunities integrated. Absolutely. And together mm -hmm. and not stand alone. Right. Um, and, you know, hopefully bring all the benefits of diversified income groups together and, and benefit the community. Right. Um, and whether that's diversified income groups, you know, it's regardless of age, it's, it's your young professionals, it's, you know, it's those folks who even at the peak of their profession or their job or their career, you know, aren't in a top income bracket. Right. Like we, we need to find a way for everyone to be safe and secure in their, their housing opportunities. There's a lot of good benefits to it. Um, 40B as a single term, I think just gets overused and misused and, and challenges what it is that people think of whenever housing developments come to town. Yeah, we, you know, we see it as, as planners and, and as town, 
managers that we need these developments for people like our firefighters and our police officers and our teachers and our young professionals to live in town and mm -hmm. to be able to be a fabric of the community, mm -hmm. which um, often is lost in that term affordable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, I sit in those meetings with whether it's, you know, the developer for, you know, well, regardless of the developers, and I, I hear the rents and I see the rents and um, it, it, they're just unattainable. Yeah. And, and how, how, do you, how do you pay that much money in rent and save money if you want to buy a house, right? Like right. if that's still the American dream, Taylor, you can tell us what the American dream is if you want. Or not. <laughs> that's, I guess I'm, I'm too old for that now. Um, but I mean, it, it's something that we need to address and, and provide opportunities for, for, for people into the community. And, and it, it's, I think, even more exacerbated in Shrewsbury, right? Because of right. that thriving demand that people have in the schools and people wanting to live here, you know, we're even a little bit more of an anomaly. I mean, I, I think if you go east from here, we're pretty similar. Yep. Maybe a little bit better position. You go west, but like we're, you know, some people well, couldn't even stomach what they see for prices and home values and lot values, you know, here in Shrewsbury. So it, it's it's an interesting challenge, right? Like you, you don't want only middle career individuals to be the only ones that live in your community. Exactly. You want the whole stratification of, of all um, phases of life. So, all right. So how many projects over the years come to mind whenever you think about 40Bs? Yeah, so um, 40B, again, is just one component of our affordable housing stock. So I'll talk about 40B first, and then if we want to talk yep. about other areas in town that have affordable housing, we can certainly do that. Um, the first 40B in town was Haynes Farm uh, off of Fruit Street and mm -hmm. Route 9. Um, that was the very first one. Um, Audubon Shrewsbury, which was Avalon Shrewsbury, is mm -hmm. a 40B project. Um, and then we have a few that are on the table now. So uh, 409 South, South Street with Gray Star Development is proposing a 40B. Uh, and there's been others that have been um, contemplating that with our departments. Mm -hmm. We also have projects that have affordable units within them through our town zoning bylaw mm -hmm. that provides for inclusionary units. Uh, so Madison Place off of Route 9 by Price Chopper has inclusionary units which mm -hmm. are deemed affordable. Uh, Quinn 35 which is at Lakeway Commons has units that are deemed affordable and Edgemere Crossing which they just opened their last apartment building for, for rent this okay. past month uh, also has affordable units within them. So what is it? What what does that mean? Inclusionary. Inclusionary means uh, we are requiring developers who want to come to Shrewsbury to build units um, to have affordable units within their development. Okay. So based upon the. Um, zoning district that they are in and the type of units that they are building, they have to provide a certain number or a certain percentage of units. So we'll take Quinn 35 and Edgemere, for example, those require 10% of the units to be affordable. So we're really just staying par, yeah. staying even. Uh, Madison Place was built in a multifamily zoning district and that required 12.5% mm -hmm. inclusionary units. Uh, similar, the uh, Beale Commons project at one through seven Maple Avenue, we're requiring 12.5% based upon the zoning district that it's located in. So just barely breaking mm -hmm. even on mm -hmm. that. So inclusionary zoning is a hot topic in the city of Worcester right it is, now. Yes. They don't have inclusionary zoning. so. As a local government right now, the city council and the other uh, folks over there can't compel people to build any affordable housing units in a city of 205,000 residents right. with a probably even a bigger income um, uh, disparity. Yeah, disparity yeah. than we have here uh, in Shrewsbury. Right. So that's very interesting. When did Shrewsbury implement uh, inclusionary zoning? They implemented inclusionary zoning at the town meeting in 2006. Oh, wow. um, actually, inclusionary zoning was talked about in the 2000 master plan and then actually implemented in 2006. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be spending some time reviewing our inclusionary zoning section now that we have an affordable housing trust mm -hmm. uh, to say, how can we build up our, our housing stock even more for, mm -hmm. for those who need affordable units in town? Mm -hmm. 
And so there's a dollar figure associated with inclusionary z zoning somehow, is that right? So there's several options. If a developer does not want to build the inclusionary units within their development, they can apply to the planning board for a special permit to pay a fee in lieu of providing an okay. inclusionary unit. And that is a dollar figure that's calculated on a yearly basis. Okay. But our preference and, and the planning board's preference recently is we should really be providing these units within the development. It's a lot easier for a developer to build that while they're on site doing their thing mm -hmm. than the town to try to be a developer and mm -hmm. build the unit. Mm -hmm. Right. Where do those fees go? Is that what? The fees go into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and then the Affordable Housing Trust can use those to uh, deed restrict units, to build units, to buy land, a variety of things. Great question. So let's talk about the quote unquote impacts of housing. So, sure. um, as I said before, you know. New growth in housing brings vibrancy, a lot of vibrancy in the town, uh, and interest in the communities based upon um, very high performing schools, um, high quality of life, very low crime, one of the lowest crime rates in the entire country. Um, and, um, you know, unlike a lot of our neighboring cities and towns, full service professional firefighters, 24 7 staffed. So we provide a full complement of services. Uh, people want to be in communities like that. Um, and then we have housing development come in, you know, and the next one along the line is just going to break the town, right? Like we're just not going to be able to afford it as soon as we get the next one. So as a town manager, I certainly have plenty of concerns and, and we need to understand the cost impacts. We need to plan for the impacts. Um, and we need to be very cognizant of impacts because every future development does impact us. Correct. But what, have, what do you know that we've seen about, you know, developments like we've been talking about, um, multifamily apartment complexes and things like that? What have the impacts been on the town historically, whether that's, um, you know, you know, kids in the schools. Let's start there, kids in the sure. schools. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So um, when I first started uh, here at town, we uh, started to put together actual factual data of how many school children are in specific residential housing mm -hmm. developments. So every year around this time, actually, um, I look at several single family uh, subdivisions, uh, several duplex uh, subdivisions, and then several multifamily projects that have been built and are mature or are new. And what the data shows us, and we're very lucky to have the school department right down the hall, walk down there, grab the data, come back and process that, is that the majority of children in our school system are from the single family subdivisions. Mm -hmm. um, there is a lesser amount in the duplex subdivisions, um, a lesser amount in the multifamily rental projects, um, and then an even lesser amount um, in the projects that we've seen most recently with uh, studio ones and twos and three bedroom mm -hmm. units. So when we have a developer coming to town, we actually draw them to that study and have them uh, make their own assumptions related to school children. Mm -hmm. And we process that through town staff and then through the boards and commissions and review that frequently with the school department as they're looking at redistricting or upgrading facilities and things like that. So I think we're one of the only towns in the Commonwealth which, with this type of data available. Mm -hmm. I know I've been asked by several other municipalities, how do you do that? How do you get that information so easily? Mm -hmm. and, and it's a very easy exercise with mm -hmm. the cooperation that we have with the school department. And they ask us the same thing on a, you know, six month basis when they're planning for their budgets for the next year for their facilities. Do we see any housing developments coming up through the pipeline? What is about to be permitted? What has been permitted? And we, mm -hmm. we have a really good relationship back and forth. But um, just for an example, uh, the Edgemere project that is fully occupied now, uh, that's 250 rental apartments down at Lake Street and Route 20, we estimated that 28 school children would be living in that facility. Um, as of October 1st, there was 22 children in the school system, mm -hmm. and we had one more building to go to get leased up. So I'm pretty confident that we'll be at 28 or slightly below mm -hmm. for the period of time coming. Interesting. 
Okay. The other type of services that we look at is that these larger apartment complexes are responsible for their own trash and recycling. So sure. the town does not pick up those services. Mm -hmm. um, and they're often um, higher contributors of taxes to the mm -hmm. town rather than a single family residence. Sure. Uh, they still require the same police and fire services as any resident would require within mm -hmm. the town. Um, and oftentimes we're able to work with the developers uh, to pay for their sewer and water improvements that they might need so that doesn't have an impact. We meet with them very early on to discuss those matters. Mm -hmm. Great. So I mean, as, I, as I've said a million times maybe already in this episode, um, folks come here, one of the primary reasons is the schools. In, in Shrewsbury Public Schools, you know, I believe it's top five, but I'll be conservative and say top 10 um, number, as far as number of students in a standalone municipal school district, right, in the Commonwealth. Right. So we're either top five or top 10 of, uh, of number of students in a, in a single town school district. So. Um, and we, of course, have had the plan for that growth over the years. We, we just built, you know, the new Beale School, and we provided capacity within that Beale School when, when we were developing it. And it's caused, um, you know, the town to always be planning um, for schools and accommodating those children as people uh, continue to want to locate here. Uh, and, and now we're going through the second iteration of you know a plan that was put in place as as uh, Richard Carney was leaving you know stint as a town manager and Dan Morgado was coming on and you know we put a 20 year study in place about what work needed done within the schools and that kind of culminated with the reconstruction which ended up being a, a new construction uh, for the Beale school and, and now we're looking at the the tw next 20 year cycle and I see the next 20 year cycle as probably more of a rehabilitation cycle because we have such good building mm -hmm. stock. Um, but we, that's another plan that we're putting in place. It's, it's basically a, a 10 to 20 year capital plan for our public school facilities. And uh, we'll be sharing that um, in a joint session with the school committee and the select board uh, at their meeting on December 6th. So that will have um, great information. Yeah, it's interesting to to see those plans that, you know, that plan was put in place in the 97, 98 timeframe and it's still in my office and it's still used. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're creating phase two or plan two of that mm -hmm. um, to be able to meet the needs of, of the residents and the, the school department. So, um, Kristen, you mentioned in, in your prior comments about you, you know, your planning staff and the, the, the other aspects of the town meet with developers early. What does that mean? And, and you know, I know that extends to commercial development, just not housing development, but we haven't talked a lot about general commercial economic development. So maybe start with telling us what's going on in town with general commercial development, doesn't include housing, um, and then how do you work a, a um, housing developer or just a general commercial developer through the planning and permitting process of the town? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, we're seeing an unprecedented amount of um, commercial development in Shrewsbury right now, both in the pre-permitting stage, the permitting stage, and the building stage. I think any resident or business owner or passerby sees construction vehicles throughout town. Um, there's a huge influx of new businesses coming to town or businesses who want to expand because you know the interest rates are changing on a daily basis we know that but there was really good interest rate there was people coming back from the COVID-19 pandemic and and really wanting to get new opportunities going and shared that the retail market is still pretty strong within the town of Shrewsbury so um, in general, we have not slowed down at all mm -hmm. from what we're seeing on the developer side of things or from business owners. They're really uh, out there, they're doing improvements. Um, and, and I think it's making the town look, look great. We're seeing a lot of, of upgrades to, to mm -hmm. bu buildings and to businesses. Um, 
we pride ourselves and our staff on meeting with developers and landowners really early on the process if we have a sense that they want to make some changes or come to town and develop. And um, I run the community development leadership team in town, which consists of planning and economic development, building inspector, uh, some of the DPW staff that oversee the utilities, uh, health department, which is really important when you're bringing on a new restaurant or uh, something like that. And we liaison with Selco to providing electric light and cable operation services and we sit at the table with developers very early on maybe they don't even have a purchase and sale agreement with a landowner or maybe they haven't told anyone else about what their plans are and we just run through what they think they want to do we provide our expertise and challenges they might see or matters that we might have in our plans that you've talked about before that we'd like them to to move forward with and they take, take back that information to their teams, to their civil engineers, to their investors, uh, even before they come before the zoning board or the planning board to get the permits that they might need. Uh, so we really pride ourselves on that customer service that we provide mm -hmm. to developers and, and business owners within Shrewsbury. Yeah. And there's a great story of that really continuing through the entire life cycle of the Lakeway Commons redevelopment project. And, and I think that's a model that we continue to use on other major projects. Yeah, absolutely. That that project I am so proud of just because the town of Shrewsbury worked with the Central Mass Regional Planning Commission. We said we have this underutilized property. What are some things that this could be used for? And they actually developed that plan for us. We held a developer meeting on how we can improve economic development in Shrewsbury and Grossman Development came to that meeting. They saw this site available and they worked through that plan that we had gone through and brought it from the back of the napkin type of drawing to what it is today. And it's it's pretty similar to what it was. And we, th we laid that out through the planning, through the zoning, uh, and, and working with that developer from day one mm -hmm. on what's a very successful redevelopment mm -hmm. project for the town of Shrewsbury. But didn't you continue like very regular meetings with the developer as they actually built. Absolutely. We yeah. had bi-weekly meetings with the, that developer. We went on site, sat in their trailer, went through all the punch list items. Same thing with Edgemere. Um, it was virtual on Zoom, but mm -hmm. we had bi-weekly meetings to make sure that we were meeting their expectations and they were meeting our expectations all throughout the what process. Are, what are some of the benefits that came up that you think would have been missed from the town's perspective? You know, I think we could just get out there and walk the site with them if we were concerned about the way pavement was looking at the point in time, or if they said, you know, the grades aren't working quite right, can we make this change? We had that open dialogue and conversation. We knew all the players at the table, too. We knew mm -hmm. who their contractors were. We knew who their uh, GC was. Uh, and, and it helps for a very healthy relationship that we knew what each other was doing mm -hmm. on, on a daily basis. Yep. A little humanization. Absolutely. You know of all of our inspectors, all their key people. Right. You know, they they knew who was gonna show up whenever they needed to uh, get a fire inspection or some other life safety inspection. That's Absolutely. Great. I know that was a huge success that uh, we continue to utilize as part of our standard uh, practices yes. uh, today. Um, so w what are some general private commercial development projects that are ongoing right now or in a mature enough uh, planning or pre-permitting pre phase that, you know, it's what broad public knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll just put a plug. Um, Taylor helped us redevelop our new website design, and the planning department has been able to revamp and make it very flashy and exciting <laughs> that we have buttons for projects that are in permitting right now and projects mm -hmm. that are under construction. So any resident who wants to take a peek there, we think it's a little bit more user friendly. So I'll go from projects that are in construction right now to projects that we see are going to be in the pipeline. Uh, Centex Park North, which was um, sold from the Shrewsbury Development Corporation in the town of Shrewsbury to Northbridge uh, at South Street and Route 20 is well underway. We think that they'll have occupancy sometime this winter for some of their first tenants. Um, so that is a, a great success over there. Again, came from a master plan that the SDC had put together, and that vision was was followed through with Northbridge development. Mm -hmm. uh, we're finalizing the Edgemere Crossing project where all of the apartments are uh, able to be occupied and the market basket and associated retail is probably coming online within the next month. Uh, so that's coming down the pipe. Again, that Route 20 corridor is really heating up 
in terms of, of development there. Um, we're seeing under construction um, some other sites that, um, you know, moving Patrick Subaru from its site on uh, Elm Street over to 701 Boston Turnpike. That's currently in permitting at this point in time. Uh, GFI, who owns Worcester Sand and Stone um, and also owns a property on Route 20, are going through permitting process mm -hmm. right now for some of their industrial that's big, buildings. That's a big project at Worcester Sand and Stone. Really big project. That's not quite at local permitting, but it's at yep. the state state review for over a million square feet. A million. Yeah, mm -hmm. in that area of town. So again, that will be one that we look at very closely of the impacts of the town services and town residents in that area. Um, you know, we're working through uh, permitting right now with 1 through 7 Maple Avenue, Civico Development at the former Beale site. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, we have a whole list of things going on. It could go on for probably another hour, but I'll let you <laughs> move us on. Sure. So um, earlier when you came in and sat down, I purposefully left off a part of your uh, title there so we could just save it to the end of sure. our conversation. Okay, so. okay. At least that's what we'll go with at this point. So um, we talked a lot about um, planning and, and economic development today. Um, there's a ton going on in town. Um, some misunderstanding of you know 40B, and I think we've we've really cl cleaned that up. But kind of the second half of your house uh, on a day-to-day -day basis is health and human services. So. Any quick updates for us in those areas or, or anything else in planning and, and yeah. economic development that you wanted to touch on before we let you go on your way? Yeah, sure. So um, just wanted to close out on our community development realm. Um, Chris McGoldrick is our new planning and economic development director. Uh, it's really exciting to see him back. He was an assistant planner for us uh, from 2016 to early 2020, went to Grafton to be their town planner and now is back. So uh, welcoming him to our community development leadership team and group. Uh, and then health and human services is uh, not an area that I was traditionally um, schooled in or um, had that realm, but uh, I think it dovetails nicely. It consists of the Council on Aging, Veteran Services, the Library, Recreation, and Health Department in terms of uh, environment, not environmental health, but preventative health more so. And some exciting things we have going on in human services is we'll hopefully be onboarding a new recreation director soon. Uh, we're you know finalizing interviews there, so that will be exciting to expand our recreation department and recreation function. Um, we are working as a team to implement translation services. We're seeing that with the influx of residents as we're having, um, there's a lot of people who don't speak English in the community and we have a need for uh, translating when they come to the counter to pay their bill or uh, if we're handing out flyers that we want it to be um, multilingual in that sense. And then uh, we're actually leveraging some money that we receive from the state um, to enhance our food security in Shrewsbury. We learned a lot uh, through the pandemic that there are a lot of people in town who have food insecurity and we can do a better job to help them with that. So working with our team to develop a plan to, to enhance services to the, to the residents here. Well, that's great. Um, so a ton going on and that will likely always be the case for all of us. And um, so that makes us very grateful for your time and, and joining us here on the Town Manager Download. Um, I think we'll end it here for today. Um, our next episode, we're going to dive into uh, the timely topic of the budgeting process and all things finance. Uh, so stay tuned uh, for more good things from the Town Manager Download.